Welcome to chapter 20 of the book of Isaiah. This chapter gives us a timeline of sorts. It says the year that Tartan entered into Ashdod. Um, this Tartan in, in the King James, in the Greek is Tanathan, who is a, a general of sorts, uh, that a ruler that was sent uh, unto Azotone in the Greek and Ashdod. And the, uh, he was, uh, when he was sent by Sargon, king of the Assyrians, uh, the Greek spelling is different than what you would expect for a Sargon. Uh, the uh, Aldine in the 16 editions, which use the, ap uh, the which Apostolic Bible comes from, uh, have uh, Arna, but the Complutensian polyglot has Narna, and uh, and Sargon was his name. So I don't know why the difference is in the Greek, but uh, there's a lot of differences when it comes to names and how they're pronounced between one language. You're going from uh, Assyrian language, Syriac language, into the um, Hebrew, then here into the Greek and into the English. But anyway, whatever this uh, Sargon will call him, uh, there's a king of the Assyrians. There were three Sargons in history from Assyria. Uh, the first was Sargon the Great, the king of Akkad, and he ruled around 2300 BC. This is around in the 700s, so uh, this would not have been that king. And then the next one was Sargon the First, who was the king of Ashur, uh, and that was around in 1900 BC, so that's another 900 years later. So the Sargon we have here, the second, is uh, the king that it's mentioning, and he was the son of Tiglath Pileser III. And Tiglath uh, Pileser uh, had the son uh, Shalmaneser, who became king afterwards, and uh, Shalmaneser was the brother of Sargon. And the son of Sargon was Shennacherib, and the grandson of Sargon was Esharhaddon, who became uh, rulers, just to get get it straight. So we have originally uh, in the Tiglath Pileser, which is mentioned in the Bible, the third, and then uh, his uh, sons, Shalm, uh, Shalmaneser the fifth, I'm sorry, uh, Sargon here, and Shalmaneser the fifth, and then so Sargon's son was Shennacherib and his grandson Esharhad. So uh, these uh, are the people that we were to be talking about from the Assyrians. Now let's find out on a map uh, where they are uh, coming from. There's Assyria, and here's Ashur and Nineveh, which was the capitals, and uh, they were in charge of this area. They had just previously defeated Babylon and destroyed the city. Now he's coming down against uh, the pharaoh of Egypt. And down here, Ashdod is down where it says Gaza. So he, uh, these uh, Assyrians go down and attack that far. And he waged war against Ashdod and overtook it. So uh, Ashdod was taken also uh, underneath the uh, Syrians, they also defeated Israel and took many of the Israelites uh, captive. That's where they get this 10 lost tribes, and they replaced them with uh, people called Samaritans who were uh, brought into the uh, area uh, that Israel was in. Now, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Isaiah, son of Amos, saying, Well, go and remove the sackcloth from your loin, and untie your sandal from your feet. So take off your robe and your sandals. And he did thus, going naked and barefoot. So uh, that's all he had on was a sackcloth. So he became naked in the word gymnos. We have gymnasium, the gym, gym from, um, they used to wrestle naked in the games in Greece and so forth. So that's why we have this word gym, gymnasium. So he went and did, did it, took his clothes off, walked around naked. Basically, now he is going to be drawing attention to himself. And the Lord said, 
in which manner Isaiah, my servant, goes naked and barefoot, three years shall be signs and miracles to the Egyptians and Ethiopians. So now the um, this going forward and naked, um, who is he going forward naked and barefoot for? Um, do they really care about the Egyptians and the Ethiopians? Well, we'll see at the end why Israel and the people of Israel that he's doing this uh, do care. So it says in verse 4, continues, For thus the king of the Assyrians shall lead the captivity of Egypt and Ethiopia. Young men and old men, presvitas, presbyterian, that's a church of elders, a naked, game noose, and barefoot, uncovering the shame of Egypt. And this happened with the king of Assyria going down uh, to Egypt. Egypt was uh, being ruled by the uh, Cushites, the uh, Nubian people from Sudan today. They were up in to Egypt and were ruling Egypt from Memphis. And the Egyptians uh, didn't have any power, but the Ethiopians did have this power. So now what happens, it's mentions in Wikipedia, which has some great articles, uh, if they're not, has to do with the Old Testament uh, Bible. But uh, if it's history, that's pretty good. But still, again, the uh, dates are questionable on when people can make a certain date. But uh, it reads, Eshar Haddon, and that was a grandson, uh, had Babylon rebuilt. Uh, he imposed a vassal treaty upon his Persian, Median, and Parthian subjects, and he once more defeated the Scythes and the Sumerians. Tiring of Egyptian in interference in the Assyrian Empire, Esher had and decided to conquer Egypt. In 671 BC, he crossed the Sinai Desert, which is down south there. That means he went through Israel, and he's crossing over the Sinai, and he invaded and took Egypt with surprising ease and speed. He drove its foreign Nubian, Cushite, and Ethiopian rulers out, destroying the Cushite Empire in the process. And Eshar Haddon declared himself king of Egypt, Libya, and Cush. Eshar Haddon stationed a small army in northern Egypt and describes how, quote, all Ethiopians, that reads Nubians and Cushites, I deported from Egypt, leaving not one left to do homage to me, unquote. He installed native Egyptian princes throughout the land to rule on his uh, behalf. So that's what happened. Then it says here in verse 5, And they shall be ashamed, being vanquished upon the Ethiopians of whom the Egyptians were relying, for they were their glory. They were the, the power, was the, the, the Nubian uh, Cushites. And the ones dwelling in the island shall say, this in that day. Behold, we were reliant to flee to them for help. So now, the ion, I don't know what the ion is. I mean, you something separate. If it's actual an ion or if it's a figure of speech, which I believe it is, and I can't think of anybody else who would be saying this, would they, then it would be Israel because they were going to be attacked also. And come, uh, Shenechrib came against Jerusalem. So, I'm sure they wanted the help from Egypt and um, the e Ethiopians, but if they were defeated by the Assyrians, then what kind of help do they have? Basically, uh, their help um, is not going to do them any uh, good. And then, uh, to be, uh, be able, how are they going to be able to deliver from the king of the Assyrians? And how shall we be uh, delivered? So, uh, I, it's a very short chapter, but then I start trying to think, well, there's got to be something in here that God wants us to know about. And it was, uh, who do we rely upon? I came up with a theme on who do we rely upon? They relied upon Israel. Uh, Israel was relying upon the uh, Egyptians. The Egyptians were relying upon the Ethiopians. And everybody was being attacked by the Assyrians who had the power. And I looked at him, well, who, who do we rely upon? Um, well, I would 
I made a list and I thought I'd share it with you. And the first one on the list was ourselves. We basically um, rely upon our, ourselves. We think that we, especially the younger you are, you have more control over things of yourself, of your body. And But we find out that um, we can end up having health issues. I've known a couple of young ladies that died in their 20s with cancer. So if you think that you have all control over your body, it, and until you find out you don't by some unfortunate misfortune like a health problem with cancer, then you find out that uh, relying upon yourself is tenuous. Uh, there's accidents that can happen. I just, downstairs, I live on a hill, and they call it Charles Hill after me, uh, the skateboarders. And they come skateboarding down this hill, and I just, the other day, I saw one laying on the grass as I drove up, and his friend was there over him, and uh, he was there for quite a while. So you can get an accident and hurt. I know another man I met here in uh, Newport, Oregon, who was uh, in a confrontation with the police, and he got drug a uh, hundred feet in a car, and he became a paraplegic uh, as far as his legs. And he, from the rest of his life, he was uh, in a wheelchair. So uh, if we rely on ourselves, we're going to have these things that can happen. Natural disasters can happen if we rely upon ourselves. All of a sudden, uh, we just had a huge hurricane season in the United States and the Caribbean, and um, a lot of people are relying uh, you know, that they think everything is going really good, living for uh, many years and no problems. All of a sudden, a hurricane comes and wipes everything out. I live, well, before I tell you where I live, well, I live on the ocean, the Oregon, right on the Oregon coast, right behind me, a block, half a block is the ocean, the water. And so uh, I had an otter, somebody called up to an otter in an apostolic Bible, and they asked me where I live. And I said, I'm, I'm right on the um, right on the Pacific Ocean. I can see the seagulls flying over me, and I can hear the um, sea lions barking. I can hear the fog horns going, and I can see two lighthouses. And they say, oh, quit, quit, quit. We don't want to hear any more, any more. And they, then the person says, well, what about tidal waves? You worry about, worry about tidal waves? And I said, right down at the bottom of my stairs, 30 stairs, there's a sign that says tidal wave uh, area in an escape route. So, uh, I could be hit by a tidal wave. Don't have any control. So this is all. What do I? Would I rely upon myself and the things that happen naturally, or so forth, or I can rely upon others. Um, you can rely upon uh, your family, your wife, uh, your parents, or your children, and these uh, are good things to rely upon. But they can. Uh, these things can all fall apart, come apart. Um, you can rely upon a spouse and have a, a divorce, adultery, or uh, whatever the, the reason for the spouse leaving. And then so your spouse is gone. You don't have that to rely upon, more so for probably a woman because they have a little bit more difficulty in a lot of societies without a husband. And um, you can have a, a death in the family that you are uh, relying upon somebody, a brother, and he can die, and you don't have uh, any uh, help there. Uh, or it uh, can be a breakup of a relationship with friends. So that's another thing you can re uh, that relying upon others is also tenuous. Another thing you can rely upon is your church. Now, it's a good thing to rely upon a church and, and put your hope that everything will be good, but sometimes churches can fail. And I had a church uh, here in uh, Newport, Oregon, that failed me at a time of need. I'm not going to go into the detail, but I um, quit going to that church uh, because of its uh, failure to do what it, what God would have it to do. Uh, it didn't do that. And so uh, a church can be, uh, can fail you. And I know a, um, a close friend that um, was a lady that was a cr Christian, the husband wasn't, and the child had two children, uh, two girls, and the one girl, um, she, uh, I don't know, she married, 
I'm not sure she was getting a divorce or something, and the mother was going to that same church I had the problem with, and uh, so uh, the people there came against uh, the daughter for uh, the daughter wasn't even going to the church. She wasn't even basically believed in Christ. But these people thought it enough to put her, you know put her down, and so I as I talked to this daughter years later that she told me this story, and I told her of the story that I had with the same church. So a church can let you down, whether you're going there or otherwise. Another thing a lot of people rely upon is a, is a government, and we know uh, that governments can fail. The Soviet Union, uh, Russia, before it was Russia today, uh, and it became uh, a gathering of nations called the Soviet Union, and these nations... Um, became communistic, sharing everything, but they became atheistic and uh, kicked God out of their lives, and it fell within around 70 years. And so all these people that were believed in communism and uh, didn't want anything to do with God were left with nothing. Uh, they, they, were, they were helpless, basically, because they didn't have government to help them, and they rejected God, so um, they didn't have anything. As far as government, there is a man called Carl Jung, J-U-N-G, who was a protege of Sigmund Freud, and Jung was a psychiatrist, which I don't have a whole lot of faith in. I was a psychiatric technician back in the 60s, 1960s, and uh, the people that I know that were psychiatric technicians or worked in the hospitals, a psychologist and so forth, had as many problems or more than the patients that were in the hospital. But uh, this Carl Jung uh, said something that I found very interesting, and here this is from Wikipedia. Uh, uh, if you look up Carl Jung, it says uh, he saw that the state was treated as, quote, a quasi-animate personality from whom everything is expected, unquote, but that this personality was, quote, only camouflage for those individuals who know how to manipulate it, unquote and referred to the state as a form of slavery. He also thought that the state, quote, swallowed up uh, peoples of religious forces, uh, unquote, and therefore that the state had, quote, taken the place of God, unquote, making it comparable to a religion in which, quote, state slavery is a form of worship, unquote. Jung observed that, quote, stage acts of life, um, the state, stage, S-T-A-G-E, acts of the state, unquote, are comparable to religious displays. Uh, quote, brass bands, flags, banners, parades, and monster demonstrations are no different in principle from ecclesiastical processions, cannonades, and fire to scare off demons, unquote. From Jung's perspective, this replacement of God with the state in a mass society led to the dislocation of the religious drive and resulted in uh, the same fanaticism of the church-state of the Dark Ages, wherein the more the state is, quote, worshipped, unquote, the more freedom and mor mor ta uh, mora morality are suppressed. This ultimately leaves the individual psychically undeveloped with extreme feelings of marginalization. Uh, that was the end of that. So th that would be putting your hope on the government. A lot of people put their hopes on the government. Look at all the different cabinet positions. Uh, defense, we'll put, it, put it in defense. Uh, education, put it, your hope on education. Rely on education. Rely on all kinds of things. Uh, and so another thing that people rely upon is materialism. If you have whatever you own, you see uh, that to warn again, ward off problems at the end times, if there is such a thing, Armageddon, on TV, you'll find people hawking uh, gold and silver bullion. And then uh, there are the people that believe in putting uh, your money in stocks and other sorts of materialism. Uh, I, at one time in the 60s, picked up a book from a lady that had it on her table. She had a couple of them and asked her if I could read it, and it was by a Harry Brown who ran uh, for president of uh, uh, the um, 
Oh, what's the party? I'm trying to think of the party. It's a, not an independent party, but um, wasn't peace and freedom. But anyway, he wrote a book, uh, How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. So I was thinking, well, that's really interesting. So I started to read it. And his thought was that, well, if you become selfish and you go out and get everything that you need, you want clothes, you want a new car, you want a boat, you want a, uh, this, you want that, get everything. And when you have everything, then you're going to be happy. And when you're happy, you're going to help other people. So I, that makes a lot of sense. I want things. So if I get all these things, I'll be happy and help other people. So I started buying all these things and getting them, cars, motorcycle, boat, and I found myself going around washing the car. As soon as the car got done, I had to go do the boat. And then I started cleaning the boat. I had to go down to the, it was in the water in the ocean, clean the boat, take care of that. Uh, starting to, uh, the w wood was getting rough. And so I uh, finished that. Then I went on to my motorcycle and I found a little rust coming up. So I started cleaning off the rust on the motorcycle and had a swimming pool in the back of the house. So I'd get done with the motorcycle. Then I would go back in the pool and get the big long um, uh, arm with the brush on it, clean the uh, swimming pool, make sure everything was there, the water was clean. And by the time I got done with that, I walked back out front and my car was dirty again. So here I go back out, do the car, then I do the boat, then I do the um, uh, motorcycle. And I got myself, that's all I was doing was cleaning everything. I wasn't happy. I was miserable. And I had all these things. And I was like, Wow, this is, <laughs> this is not it. Other people can rely upon a pleasure, uh, hedonism, being, doing whatever you want to do, not having to do what others uh, would tell you to do uh, or want you to do, uh, doing whatever you feel like doing. I, you hear about people wanting to run away from any type of authority. Just do what I want to do and not, don't care about anybody else, including God. And um, that is, I've seen people that become hermits and they live out in the wilderness and they can become very miserable. And uh, this going, doing whatever you want for yourself, you're so uh, in tune with doing this all the time that you become a, a self-centered person, not necessarily selfish. You can be uh, very generous with other people, but with your generosity, you want them to do what you want them to do. And so you become self-centered. Relying upon drugs, people rely upon alcohol. Think that well, I'm gonna, I can't make it through the day unless I have that drink or that beer or, or whatever. And uh, people rely upon um, uh, other things. I mean, you can have other substances in your body, not necessarily relying on them. They can be, they can take over your body and your like nicotine and caffeine, a uh, pot. Uh, people can smoke pot and they can end up becoming uh, like walking, somewhat like walking zombies, uh, not to get a whole lot done after they smoke the pot. And they can be high all day long and uh, not get a whole lot done. Other people use uh, drugs uh, like uppers and downers, methamphetamines and uh, tranquilizers, and become schizoid. Uh, I've seen people like that. They're they're normally okay when they get depressed, so they take an upper, and all of a sudden, whammo! They, they get in your face and argue and want to fight and everything, and then they start coming back down, and then they're uh, the opposite, and they become schizoid. And people on hard drugs, I mean, I've seen them. Once they get onto that, it's like they become just uh, horribly uh, destroyed physically, mentally, emotionally, and everything. Other people can rely upon gambling. Right this past week, we had a man in Las Vegas who went and killed, 50, I don't know, 55, 60 people with a gun, knocked out the window of the high rise and started shooting everybody that was at a concert and killed 59 people, wounded 400. And everybody's trying to figure out, well, I wonder why this guy did this. Was he a terrorist or was he uh, didn't like uh, country music? Or was he uh, a, a Muslim or all these different things? And I, I right away, I think I can see why this guy's upset and why he did that. He's mad at himself. You know, he's completely out of control. He's in control of gambling. They said his hands on the machines were going so fast you couldn't believe it. He would run five uh, decks of cards at one time on this machine, and he'd be going like this, and it would he would go through thousands, I don't know, 10000 dollars an hour in the machine and he was doing uh, this all the time 
Well, I could see where after doing this 10 or 15 years, you could become all of a sudden you could snap and say that I'm controlled by this whole thing. And I hate uh, it's like the person that hates uh, smoking. They become angry whenever anybody smokes. Get out of there. Get away from me. I don't want to smell that stuff. And they can become very angry. I could see where I could bust out the window and just want to shoot everybody that's in Las Vegas. Kill them all if I can. And so gambling is uh, uh, you can lose a lot, hurt your family also. Uh, sex is another thing people can rely upon. Uh, I'm not a woman, so I don't know how they can rely upon sex, but um, there is adultery. I know that. They want to find a relationship that's not uh, their a spouse and that causes a break of, breakup of a, a family, Not a, let alone that you can get a disease from it, either a male or a female, and worse, spread it to somebody else that doesn't know anything about it. Then you can get uh, hooked on the pornography, which uh, can give you a lot of guilt if you're a Christian. And uh, if you're not, uh, it can cause a person to not want to have relations with the spouse, and probably more so a man, but uh, then you would end up having a broken relationship. And the person uh, is stuck with pornography, and the spouse is gone, and all they become lonely because they don't have anybody anymore. It just takes its toll. Then you can rely upon politics. You can get very political. Well, that sounds really good, but except that the last election in the United States, I had a tremendous amount of people that thought this one person was going to win, a first woman that was running uh, for president of the United States. And everybody had her way ahead. Even she thought she was way ahead. Oh, it was just amazing. And then all of a sudden, the man who ran against her uh, at the end uh, defeats her quite by quite a bit. And so uh, everybody, it showed pictures of them. I mean, they were just destroyed uh, that were, had all their hope uh, in this woman. It could have been the opposite. The woman could have won and the men and all those people would have been uh, destroyed. And it says that the people that uh, lost the election... Uh, are still uh, it within uh, going to psychiatrists to deal with this loss. So when you get involved in politics uh, that much, those types of things that take over. And then uh, sports, uh, a lot of men more so than women get involved with sports. I got real involved in uh, UCLA basketball back in the 1970s. And um, John Wooden was the coach and they had like 10 years they finally won the national championship they'd maybe lose some years they never lost a game every once in a while they would lose one game in a year well I would watch every game on tv and they would lose a game I would be ruined for two or three days I couldn't handle it it was just ruined my life but they lost a stupid game and I'd become a, a wreck so um, you can be uh, get all caught up in um personal appearance, um, how you look. I had a, a friend that had, went up to uh, Canada, had a had a appendicitis, ended up in the hospital. And in that ward that the person was in was this lady that uh, had a, um, um, she was just uh, almost catatonic, just sitting there staring out the window all the time and um, in a gown and uh, long gray hair, just looked terrible and just really down. And I started trying to talk to her, and she wouldn't talk. And I just go sit next to her, and sit next to her, and you know, try to, as long as I was in there. And all of a sudden, um, she started talking to me. And then uh, one day, this lady friend came in, who was just dressed to the hilt. It was up in Victoria, British Columbia, and like the English, they dress immaculate. This woman was dressed immaculate, and there was about seventy. And this other lady that was in the hospital, she had some type of an ailment, ailment that she had to be in there. And so for a long time, and she says, I used to be her friend and I would dress like that. And uh, clothes and her appearance was gone. She didn't have any, um, any of that. It was taken away. And I had a friend uh, who married a, a lady that uh, she would spend an hour in front of the mirror in the morning getting uh, ready. <laughs> And now I'm not saying women, you know, putting on makeup is bad or anything like that. But you can go in the Bible and find out if you're a woman that, you know, 
it's not the most important thing. Jesus says, you know, what you wear is not important. The, you know, the, bir the birds are dressed better than we are anyway, and they don't work, do anything, and um, they don't use uh, makeup and all these things. And uh, so uh, another thing we can rely upon uh, is inner entertainment, basically escapism. If we don't have God, we want to escape problems that are everyday problems. So how do we do that? Well, we can sit there and watch TV uh, day and night. Women can watch it uh, uh, if they're not working, uh, uh, soapbox operas, men's sports. Uh, or you can get into compute, uh, uh, go into uh, concerts uh, on the weekends, and this is what you're living for, to go to the concert. Uh, you can get into going to movies and watching movies on TV uh, and the Internet. Or uh, young people can get in uh, to computer games and uh, spend all their time in front of the um, computer, the game machine, and just tip, 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 they're spending all day uh, doing that. So being delivered uh, from the king of the Assyrians, so they, how are we going to be delivered? And the, the, they're relying on all these things that I said. Well, now, uh, how are we going to be delivered. What is all, so I bring out all these things. And to me, the ways uh, for us to be delivered uh, are instead of relying upon these other things, or of course, first to rely upon God. Now, how do you rely upon God? Well, I think the first thing you have to do to rely upon God is to know God. If you don't know God, then you can't rely, you won't be relying upon God. And you want to make sure you're relying upon the God, not a God, small a God, small g God. Uh, you want to know uh, the true God who I believe is in uh, the scriptures, the Old and the New Testament. He has revealed himself uh, to us. So to know God is and to understand that he is the true God and that he has communicated with us through his scriptures, then we open up a Bible. And the Bible, here I have one right here. This is a really a neat one. Show it with you. Uh, see it? There, 1709. Boy, the Lord brought that into my life. And it's Greek. And at the bottom it has all these footnotes on the Old Testament. And I hope you can see that there. And I have behind me all kinds of Bibles. And I love God's Word. And I just can't get enough of it. And I have, uh, don't have a spouse or children, to wor uh, not to worry about, but to take care of or do anything. So I'm able to spend all my time doing what I'm doing here. So, uh, and what am I doing? Um, it's a service, a service uh, to the body of Christ. I share God's word. I send out the Bibles and so forth. But uh, everybody's not going to be translating the Bible and doing what I'm doing. But there's a lot of things uh, in service you can do. You can um, join a church. And before I was, you know, churches can fail and do bad things, but you can, there's a lot of really good churches. I went to one for years down in uh, Costa Mesa, California, and they had uh, a lot of different services for different types of uh, ministries to uh, different ethnic uh, groups, married, single, over 50, over 70, uh, all sorts. Now, you can go there and get involved in the ministries, or you can uh, go to, uh, uh, if you're a child, so take your children to Sunday school or get involved in a Sunday school teaching. And um, you can do a, a service. I volunteered, I said before I was a um, I was a um, psychiatric technician at a state hospital in Southern California. But I got out of that for 20 or 30 years. And so uh, this church, mega church, had a service that went to the, um, to the uh, state hospital that I had been in years before. So I went there and pushed uh, people to the, um, to the uh, church service. So you can uh, do things like that. Then uh, you can become uh, an elder if you're older and... Uh, help deciding what's going on in the church and uh, as a as a leader, just a lot of things in church. Then you can uh, be uh, have a service with a civic service with your uh, the city, state, government of some sort. 
Uh, you can get involved with helping in child care. It doesn't have to be Christian, but uh, or if it is, that would be good. Uh, then uh, taking care, if you're a young woman, maybe you would uh, want to do that, take care of being in child care. Or if you're a young man, be getting involved in sports, teaching uh, young boys, they like to play baseball and uh, different types of uh, sports. And I don't know what little girls like, so I'm not going to leave that one out. But uh, And as you grow older, then uh, your civic service uh, can be, and you can even, uh, I'm not going to say you should run for an office, but I suppose if the Lord puts it on your heart and this is what your interest is, and why not? Then you get older, you can do what I did. I became, um, uh, I became 65. I went to the senior center and I walked in the door and I said, here I am. And they said, yeah. And I, I said, here I am. And they said, well, so? And I said, what about it? And I said, I'm 65 today. Oh, come right on in. We understand. Come right over here. And they brought me in when they were having a lunch uh, and sat me down at this uh, table of, uh, of six or seven people that were in their 80s. And they looked at me and they said, are you here to visit? And I said, no, I'm, uh, I'm here to be, a, I'm a senior citizen. And they said, oh, look how, look how young they are. I can't believe it. So, um, I felt guilty. It was like I'm this all these old people and they're so I started cleaning up the tables and after the table after everybody ate then I would clean up the table and take it into the uh, dishwasher and he'd uh, he would um, wash the dishes. I'd get a free lunch and I enjoyed doing it. And so I was able uh, to work there in a senior center. You could work in a food share type of a thing. And then another service would be to your family, which maybe would come after the church. And um, your family, you can help, you know, your son, if you're on a farm, uh, teaching him the things he needs to know to make a, uh, make a go on the farm and so forth. Or if, uh, in, uh, if, you're a, if he likes to play sports and he's in school to go watch and share in the sports, uh, if it's a daughter and she's a cheerleader or whatever, being involved and show an interest uh, in uh, the school. And uh, the older you get, if you uh, have parents that are elderly, then you can go and visit them, call them up, and help them uh, understand um, how to operate a tablet or a cell phone. Well, forget that. You probably can't do that. You could probably have to five, get your five-year-old or six-year-old to help the elderly, and the elderly really appreciate the five- and six-year-old teaching them how to um, to uh, do something, a service. And so they're both a little child's helping the elderly person and the elderly person just really enjoy being with the little child. So all these services that uh, we can do, all these things relying upon the wrong thing and relying upon the good thing, it's all a lesson in one short chapter of God's word. Reading God's word is the number one thing to know all these things and to learn. And uh, I hope uh, all these things that I've brought out are uh, to help of uh, somebody, or you can help somebody that's uh, in a place of, that needs uh, help. Chapter 21, it goes in to the vision of the wilderness. We don't, uh, we'll find out what that vision that Isaiah has in the next chapter, and I hope you'll join us in chapter 21. And God bless.